Welcome everyone uh, to our last in this year's uh, film series, Cinema of Conflict and Transformation. Um, we will have new programming for next year, and I'm excited about our work to kind of figure out what will resonate with you and what we find useful and fun as we discuss peace and conflict studies issues. Uh, my name is Shirin Kostropur. I'm director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. I'm also a psychology professor at ACC. And um, tonight, I am super duper delighted to have not only um, Dr. Mark Cunningham, who is the curator who, who runs and curates our film series with us now, but also Dr. Mocha Jean Harrop, who founded this film series working with us years ago. How many years ago? I don't yes. even remember. I think it's 10 now. My God, wow. Wow. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe some more. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Mocha was um, uh, joined us as we were founding the degree program in peace and conflict studies and, uh, and the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. So, I consider her a founding member of our uh, center and program. And it's super delightful to have her back with us tonight for this discussion of this film series. We also have Dr. Sarah Bowman um, with us. Um, Sarah has been working with us for a long time as well, and uh, she is currently the coordinator for the degree program in interdisciplinary studies, peace and conflict studies. So if you have an interest or questions about the degree program, you can contact Sarah or contact me um, and we will get you started. Right. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cunningham. Oh. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our last film in our series for this school year uh, or term. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Cunningham. I'm a professor in the radio, television, and film department. I teach courses in uh, Intro to Cinema, Intro to RTF, uh, and I also teach media literacy courses. Uh, I'm currently uh, finishing up doing the final stages of, of a book I'm writing on John Singleton for Columbia University Press. So I'm excited about that. Just heard from my editor. So <laughs> uh, I'll get the peer reviews at the end of this month. So it's pretty exciting to see that moving forward. So I'm very, very happy to be here with Dr. Mocha Jane Hirup, who uh, I used to work with in the RTF department and, uh, and just have just, just found her to be a wonderful colleague and have heard, you know, students and, and other members of the department say such wonderful things about her. And so I wish we had gotten to work a lot more closely together when you were here, but you've gone on to bigger and better things. And so I'll let you tell uh, our listeners and viewers about that now, Dr. Harrop. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. And it's really good to be with all of you. And uh, Mark, really, I couldn't be happier that um, you know, the space I left went to went to you. Um, I think you're just a great contribution to the oh, department and the college. And I'm just like thrilled. You know, it's like when I sometimes feel a little sad, like, oh, you know, I'm just I'm like, you know what though? No, Mark Cunningham is doing, I mean, that's just that's perfect. Um, I think that yes, it was really great. Um, and so yeah, I mean on the East Coast now after uh couple years in Seattle, um, but I'm on the south coast of Massachusetts. You know, I left Texas because I like the seasons. And um, yeah, I just, you know, as Shireen said, I was involved in the early days of the Peace and Conflict Studies program, and it was probably the most, you know, rewarding and uh, meaningful experience, one of the most rewarding and meaningful experiences that I had at ACC. And it was a real honor to create the Cinema of Peace and Conflict, wait, Conflict, what is it? Cinema of Conflict transform. What is it called? Cinema. Cinema. Conflict and transformation. Conflict. Yes. Okay. I'm like a little nervous. All right. Um, yes. The thing that I founded that I can't remember the name of. Okay. Yes. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, but it was always like such a great way to engage with students and engage with issues in a way that made it accessible. Uh, so anyway, yeah. TLDR. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's jump right into it. As everyone present knows, uh, we talk, we screen Jenny Livingston's documentary, 
a very famous documentary, actually, Paris is Burning, uh, which is about uh, drag culture on the East Coast, uh, primarily in the 1980s. And, you know, I mean, this is a film that, you know, gets brought up a lot uh, in terms of when we speak about, you know, influential documentaries. This is a film that gets talked about quite a bit. So I'm, I'm very happy to be talking about this. We've certainly seen how this documentary has even reached into our popular culture today, most notably with the television show created by uh, Ryan Murphy and Janet Mock and Our Lady J and Stephen Canals called Pose, uh, which took a lot of the, the people who are featured in Paris is Burning, took a lot of their real life true stories and kind of brought them into the fictional stage with Pose nonetheless, but to kind of bring, make these stories more universal. Uh, and, and, and to have a show that is, that was in fact created, run by, written by, directed by people who are gay, transgender, uh, you know, which we don't often get. So that was really, really good to get that perspective with that show. So just to start off, Dr. Harrop, if you could tell us, could you speak a bit uh, to the ball culture that's so vividly featured in Paris is Burning? Yes, and I'm glad this is the first question and I can 100% not speak to the culture of the ballroom. Um, because like Jenny Livingston, uh, I am white, uh, middle-class, grew up in the suburbs. So this is a culture that I admire and am drawn to and fascinated by and inspired by, um, but I could not call it my own culture. And it's really important to highlight that um, because of you know the controversy of Jenny Livingston making this film, and we'll get into that. Um, but so that said, you know, I, so I just want to highlight, I am coming at this as an outsider of the culture. That said, I do think that I can speak about representing that culture and what comes into play, you know, with the choices that are made and what gets maneuvered and like talk about the ideology of that representation, you know, all of that, and also being queer and non-binary, um, that definitely, you know, the overlap, the intersectionality, you can definitely talk a lot about that. And having uh, taught documentary and uh, my graduate focus was on experimental documentary. And this is a film that I've taught a lot in different classes, most recently, social issues and documentary at Suffolk University. So I do think that I can definitely talk about the representation of the culture, um, but you know, Livingston and rightly so came under great criticism um, by folks like Bell Hooks and others for, you know, not that she made the documentary as an outsider, not so much that, but that she didn't highlight that. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't bring that in to the discussion, right? It wasn't highlighted that she was an outsider and this is a very particular perspective and there was no acknowledgement of the history of the white gaze looking at the, you know, quote, other, right, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, well, I'm sure we'll get into more of that too, but really important to, to highlight, you know, who's talking and where we're coming from. Right, nice. Yeah, and so, you know, in the film, you know, I noticed and just thematically speaking that there are real, a lot of parallels, uh, for example, well, one, no, most notably, like one of the interviewees specifically mentions wanting to be a spoil, right, uh, spoiled white rich girl. Uh, and this is, you know, this is a documentary that's largely populated with people from black and Latino cultures. Uh, and, you know, and then you have another one of the, the participants or interviewees in the film uh, who's enamored with Paulina Poroskova, uh, the model. So given that many of these women, you know, again, like I said, are featured are of color, how does the standard of beauty and its connection to whiteness figure within drag culture? Yeah, I mean, I think Bell Hooks does a great job of talking about this. You know, in, in her article, Is Paris Burning? And looking at the tragedy that she sees of equating femininity and beauty um, with whiteness. And here's a great quote, I'll just share my screen for a second. Will I share my screen? I'm not seeing my screen. That's her. I think Layla is trying to give you co-hosting. I've already, uh activated the multiple share thing um, so it comes up i see desktop one desktop two but i see a triangle and an exclamation mark so i think if i share it we're not going to get what i think we're going to get 
the open system crown. I guess we could have gone over this before. Okay, I might look at that while Mark's talking. Okay, that's okay though. Mm -hmm. But um, Dorian Carey in the film has a great quote, you know, no black drag queen of their day wanted to be Lena Horne. You know, mm -hmm. and so, you know, for folks who maybe don't know, you know, Lena Horne was, you know, a black singer. Um, I think she came to prominence in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, beautiful, glamorous, you know, all the things. Um, but, you know, and an incredible role model in many ways. But, you know, the, the queens in the film, right, who, you know, who are they thinking of, right? They're, you know, like Faye Dunaway, Lena Turner, right? It's, it's all whiteness. And the, the richness that they do, the wealth, is a certain kind of white wealth. And in, um, Hooks talks about, you know, this is another great quote, where uh, she says, the uh, film is a graphic documentary portrait of the way in which colonized black people, in this case, black gay brothers, some of whom were drag queens, worship at the throne of whiteness. Mm -hmm. Even when such worship demands that we live in perpetual self-hate, steal, lie, go hungry, and even die in its pursuit. Um, and so while, you know, in so many ways, the film is celebratory, uh, I do think that it also represents a kind of, you know, internalized self-rejection. Um, I mean, I think that's one theory, but I've certainly heard, you know, other people respond to the film and, and, and really believe that what we're seeing is agency coming from the people. And I would, you know, I think we're seeing both. I mean, I think that, you know, particularly Dorian Carey and I mean, Pepper LaBeja, they are really, uh, you know, they represent themselves and they tell the story of drag and who they are. And they come across with, with great wisdom and knowledge. And so, I mean, I do think we can't say completely, you know, they're all without agency, but yeah, I think we're definitely seeing a problematic representation of um, beauty equated with whiteness. Yeah. I, I even also wondered too, in the ways in which, you know, the spaces in which they were seeing uh, this representation in, in magazines like Vogue and Harper's, you know, places like that. And that's largely what they were getting. And so I was wondering even too, if that even had a connection with it too, like what they were being faced with is kind of what, you know, in terms of popular culture, that's what they gravitated towards in that way. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you know, we're talking about the eighties, I mean, Dynasty, Dallas, mm -hmm. you know, there's, I mean, there's a long tradition of the media fetishizing a certain kind of wealth. Mm -hmm. And I was just actually just reading something about telenovelas, right? Mm -hmm. um, Spanish language, soap operas, and how common the theme of wealth and, you know, the maid becoming, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the rich guy is enamored with the maid, you know, she like rises up, and, you know, transcends her class and how it's like, it's popular in some of the, you know, most static, class societies, you know, there are like where class mobility is, you know, you've got like a 0.001% of class mobility and how that story though becomes something that people become fascinated with almost as, I mean, I would say subconsciously as a, a way of coping, you know, the lack of the possibility of class mobility. And so, you know, I mean, certainly I think we see that here, um, Mm -hmm. uh, not just in black subculture balls, you know, but uh, the whole society, right? Our mm -hmm. whole society, not well, blanket statements, but you know, a great majority, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a, there's just a lot of popular media out there that fetishizes wealth. Um, I don't know if you saw Big Small Lies, the the anthology, uh, which is great with Reese Witherspoon and oh yeah, Big Little yeah 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 yeah, and they're in California and they're in these beautiful homes right on the beach, you know, and uh, I. <laughs> So some great articles referring to it as uh, real estate porn. Yes, and I can see that too. I've watched the, both of the both seasons of that, and it's true. Those houses are like you find yourself gawking over the house. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's like town and country with sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, right, right. And, and the architecture is the most interesting. <laughs> it kind of stands out as like one of the characters and. In, 
in the story as well. And, and that's something even too, I noticed even in just watching it again, just how much emphasis is placed on the parallel of wealth and happiness or something like a wealth kind of signifying, right? Having overcome some things or having made it in a, in a particular way, right? And particularly in drag culture because it becomes so important, right? In the way that they're able to afford, you know, luxury couture, things of that nature, right? In order to wear at the balls or whatever else to distinguish themselves. And so that wealth becomes important. It's either that or stealing, right? Which I remember in the documentary they say, Popping. you can look at, yeah, you can look at people's faces and tell whether they, what they wore, whether they bought it or they stole it. <laughs> yeah, it becomes really important for that, yeah. Yeah, there's that one moment, is it, is it Willie Ninja? I can't remember towards the end, there's someone saying, you know, about the earrings that they have and just how proud of they are. And they said, you know, yeah. I, I bought it. Oh, no, the guy, I yes, thought. he did, yeah, huh? Yeah. yeah, and how, you know, that just becomes such an elevated point of accomplishment, you know? In the, I mean, it's not to degrade that, but um, I just remember that really being very salient. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, like you said, it was such emphasis on that. Wanted to make sure everybody knew he had paid for, you know, paid for those things. I mean, paid yeah. for those things, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we can also like give a counter reading though. Okay, so I mean, I definitely think that all of this is evident in the film. You know, there's a tragic representation of fetishizing wealth and equating whiteness with beauty. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if we wanted to give our subjects some more agency um, and give another reading, I mean, you could look at it as a dislodging the performance of wealth, right? Like maybe destabilizing that a little bit, you know, like who's to say that people are fully aware that what they're doing is perform, you know, that they're aware that they're calling attention mm -hmm. to the pageantry of wealth and the performance of wealth, you know, and how, you know, I mean, aside from just having expensive things, but you know, the reason why you're showcasing the expensive things or the expensive knockoffs and and how we, you know, we think of we think of costumes as being a vampire mm -hmm. or Frankenstein, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, every day we put on a costume and um, you know, wealth is a costume and yeah. to a certain extent. I remember talking with one student once a long time ago who was, you know, talking about, I don't, you know, we were talking about something queer. It's like, I don't, you know, I had this friend and he just came out and he was, you know, he was perfectly normal <laughs> before. And now he's like wearing all this flamboyant stuff and like, why can't he just be himself? And I was like, well, you know, who's to say who's his true self is, you know, why, why would you say that that was his true self was before, you know, the flamboyant mm -hmm. and the flamboyant thing, it's only a problem if you think that, you know, femininity and a femininity right. is an issue, but then he, and the dude, I loved him, he was wearing like a ball cap and khakis. I was like, you know, I mean, look, you're straight. Yeah. I mean, you get up every morning and you dress to be straight. Like you are wearing a straight uniform. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. it. You know, like all the, all the straight signifiers there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in some ways, it's like it kind of, it, it does dislodge maybe those signifiers a little bit. And I love that you say performance of wealth. My master's degree is in speech communication with an emphasis on performance studies. And we talk about like the way in which, right, we perform, like you say, this everyday performance, right? And so, and thinking about the film, and this performance of wealth. And then like you mentioned earlier, and they even talk about in the documentary as well, this kind of alignment with television shows of the eighties like Dynasty and, and, and you know, Falcon Crest and all over. But the thing of them having the, the, the ball gowns or the gowns or the dresses with the big shoulders and, you know, turned a certain way, the posing and all of that is, you know, is, they're directly emulating, right? This kind of presentation of wealth as it's performed in popular culture. And certainly at the time. Right. And so for them, and even the way they talk about too, that uh, Dorian was saying, you know, about like, no, nobody wants to wear, you know, the ornate costumes. It's all couture now. Like every, all that shifting of performance of wealth is not being as ornate as probably, but how, you know, how rich can you look, right? In terms of the performance of that as part of everyday performance. Yeah. I mean, you think about, you know, luxury labels. I mean, you know, something like a Burberry or Chanel, whatever, you know, they're, they're quality products, but mm -hmm. the markup, I mean, are they worth, you know, is the bag worth $100 or is it worth, you know, is it really worth 5,000, yeah. you know? Um, and so, 
but but if people pay that because you're not paying for the thing itself you're paying for what the thing says about right. you right. and so i mean that's exactly what the ball culture is like they're fully yeah. aware right yeah. that we are getting these labels because of what it means of the sign of right. it's a trophy right and so many of the houses are named after right uh some of those designers or, some, right. or the supermodels themselves, like they're named after those. It's so interesting. And it's like Shereen is saying here about this, in this culture, the drag culture, they are very honest and, and very self-aware about what's happening and what's going on. And so it's not like they're under any false, you know, any type of delusion, right? That, you know, what they're doing is not performative. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, agree. So one of the women, interviewed in the documentary said, uh, specifically, I'm quoting her, she said, I can't say how a woman feels. I can only say what a man who dresses as a woman feels. The vagina doesn't mean a fabulous life. So how does, how does that connect to the way transgender culture currently speaks to concerns of identity? And given the time of this film's release, is this kind of a more archaic way to speak to identity? So what do you hear in that statement when you, when you, when you listen to it? Yeah, it's such an interesting statement. And, uh, you know, when you think about how, how does it hold up today? I mean, even, you know, reading the Bell Hooks article mm -hmm. and hearing what, how the folks are referring to themselves. Um, Bell Hooks often calls them he, she. Um, yeah. A lot of the, the drag queens refer to themselves as he at times. And I have a feeling that where today, I don't think everybody would, uh, I think some of them might, very well hold on to the the he pronoun but i have a feeling that more of them would just be full on she and i don't think there would be any question i don't think we'd see the he slash she right. that hooks is using right you know like if someone is claiming female femininity woman you know these are my pronouns um can we go with that mm -hmm. um but yeah so what that person is saying you know with like well i can't speak to being a woman, let me, I wrote that in a little bit of question so I can have that right. Um, what question is that? What number? Number four. Oh yeah, I can't say, okay, okay. I can't say how a woman feels. I can only say what a man who dresses as a woman feels. So yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, this is someone who it makes total sense. It's coming from someone who is, you know, I am very clearly a man who, performs as a woman and my fundamental identity is either male or um, it's non-binary. But I think, you know, this could upset people, right? Because right now the in the trans community, there's a lot of debate and frustration and conflict around this idea of, you know, realness and being a real woman mm -hmm. and how, you know, uh, transgender women argue that and you know transgender men and trans people you know argue that you know when they were when their bodies look different let's say it's not mm -hmm. that you know they were a man who became a woman or a woman who became you know they were always right. a woman they were always a man and they had corrective surgery right if they went that route okay and that's i think that's a perfectly valid experience um and perfectly valid way of identifying yourself right but what, what the person is saying here is that it's not just about identity, right? Mm -hmm. It's about experience mm -hmm. and it's about the cultural, uh, how you've been acculturated and what your social experience was like, you know, growing up. And I do believe that that is significant. And mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, I guess for me, right? I get frustrated with the, the, the conflict around realness uh, because I don't believe in real women and I don't believe in real men. You know, like I don't think there's like a vault somewhere that like here is what the absolute woman is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone is sort of, you know, like if you give us, well, you know, if you're born without ovaries, are you still born without testicles? Are you still, you know, like there's so many different variants. Like there is no such thing as, you know, real man, real woman. Um, it's I mean, that gets into, you know, Butler, the whole idea of, it's not just that you're performing gender, it's that, you know, it's like sex itself 
is a performance. This whole idea of sex is a performance. Not that you can, you know, willy nilly like just change it around, but it's a construction. Like we've, we've created this idea of a binary as if it makes sense and that's natural and that's the universal way of things. You know, when in fact, their gender can be expressed in a lot of different ways than, you know, just a simple male, female binary. Okay. So what I like about what she says is that she's, she's highlighting the realness of experience, you mm -hmm. know, like that's something I can get behind the realness of experience. And I think that ultimately can be, get us to a more, in some ways, a more productive place, a more inclusive place, uh, a less, you know, uh, I don't want to say conflict, um, maybe a more accepting space. Mm -hmm. However, however, as long as we live in a society in which civil rights are granted based on one's identity, like there, it absolutely becomes very important to assert your identity as a woman and demand to be treated equally as a woman, to you know, assert your identity as a black American and demand you know, equity. Um, all those things. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting, right? Because it, it like, it becomes politically expedient, but it doesn't necessarily reflect, I think the complexity of our realities. And um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a statement that uh, people would have some issues with today. Yeah, it stuck out to me when I listened to it, particularly now, as you know, we become more aware about your, I mean, my students teach me so much about uh, you know, transgender culture and 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 the, and the shift in the way we think about identities. And uh, even this semester, I'm learning a lot from my students with some of the films that I'm teaching, and and having and and have had to be educated on some things that I thought were the case. Whatever. So when I hear when I heard uh, that be said, of uh, a, a pepper, they said that like when I heard that be said, I was like, wow that sounds so different than what my students who are transgender, what I know of the transgender community, it sounds so different than what they're saying. Like, how is that, how would that be taken now? I mean, the movie that is made in the 80s, 86, I think, right? Uh, how would that be accepted now? How would that, be, you know, how? And it, it just completely st stuck out to me. Because like I say, again, it's so different than where we are now in that discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but I think she articulates it really well. You know, she's not taking away right. the realness of being uh, a woman, right? Or anybody, you know, any trans woman being a woman for their duration of their life. And at the same time, there is a discernible different experience, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that, that this person had that maybe another woman, right? From, from another woman. And that to, to deny that experience, I think, leads us down a difficult path. Right. So Layla mentions here that, you know, Pepper comes back to that issue towards the end of the film and kind of elaborates uh, a bit more on it, on the decision not to get a sex change operation. And it uh, seemed as though they were alluding to the kind of violence and misogyny that women encounter and not wanting to put themselves in that position of vulnerability. Uh, and Layla said, of course, just to say, Layla, you're saying that that's your reading of it. Uh, but yeah, like, like that, and I do remember them talking about that, this kind of the set, you know, in, in transitioning and their safety as, 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 as people and women and what have you. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was really interesting. Really, it was really a complicated statement, I thought. Uh, and, and, and I, and it's so funny because I kind of did with that statement, what I tell my students not to do, <laughs> which is remember the time period the film is, be, is made. And, and, and not try not to apply a sensibility of today to, or a thinking of today to what was going on at that time period. And I did what I tell them not to do. <laughs> when, I, when I read that, uh, when I heard that statement, it just immediately stuck out in that way. Um, what role though, I mean, so this is a, an, uh, and I think people, you know, I know people are saying this to be funny, I think sometimes, but I think it raises an interesting point. So, you know, Elliot Page. Mm. Uh, from the Umbrella Academy, who we know probably from Juno, uh, there have been, there's, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that now, you know, that Elliot has, you know, transitioned, she's a man, uh, he's a man now, rather, uh, that now he's a member of the patriarchy, he's a member of the white male patriarchy, uh, and, you know, and I thought about that, so in thinking about this film and the way that they talk about uh, 
you know, things of like identity and who they are as women, what role does feminism have in drag and transgender cultures? And is there a place for these cultures in the discussion of feminism? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a place for drag and trans culture in feminism and for feminism in drag and trans culture, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, right? I think that uh, drag and trans culture definitely need to investigate misogyny and sexism. It's, you know, just because you're queer or you're trans, it doesn't mean that you haven't internalized um, patriarchal patterns and ways of thinking. And it, it also doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, we live in an understanding of intersectionality now, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can occupy multiple subject positions. You can, in some ways, be part of the dominant culture, in some ways, part of the subordinate culture, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can be both. Um, and so, yeah, you know, Elliot Page, absolutely. I mean, he has a kind of privilege now um, that is different mm -hmm. from when he was Ellen. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's also now trans. And so he loses a certain kind of privilege, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to, to, right, you know, to understand that these are definitely, that we're always intersectional mm -hmm. and that, let's see, I covered, yeah, so, right, so feminism and trans, okay, and then, uh, right, and then trans and queer culture and feminism, I mean, you know, feminism, the feminist movement is notorious for being um, in, in, well, I would say the feminist movement that was hit the mainstream, right, that we heard about, because there were actually lots of people of color mm -hmm. feminist movements, um, but, you know, the big ones, the glorious sign them, all of that, um, you know, notorious for being white and unaware of privilege, mm -hmm. right? And doing things My that fit into white supremacist culture and uh, being exclusive and, uh, you know, the whole lavender scare, right? Where mm -hmm. they drummed out the lesbians because they didn't want it to dilute the movement, right? All of that. So, yeah, you know, everyone needs to learn from each other and we need to we need to learn how to move forward and work together and with the understanding that we are assemblages right we are an assemblage of identities and we are an assemblage of movements you know coalition movements um and that assemblage it's you know like what's that game with the different right anyway um it's not it's not static you know it's dynamic right it's constantly shifting and uh it's important that we are aware of how our movement and how ourselves are occupying uh, places of privilege and places of, I don't want to say victim, but places of being repressed, I guess, at the same time. But, you know, just because you are, you know, I mean, I think we saw this like, I don't know, Todd Haynes did a great film. Todd Haynes does a lot of yes. great films. Um, but he, you know, he's been really clear to interrogate the idea of like, you know, the gay man, right, who comes out, the gay white man, mm -hmm. um, and just feels like, you know, society owes him something now because he's, you know, he's been deprived of his absolute power of patriarchy, you know, and like, you know, and thinks he's so oppressed and has no understanding of how much power he still has, mm. right, compared to women, compared to people of color, compared to right. black women, compared to Black men, et cetera, et cetera. You really see that in Far From Heaven. Yes, yes. Really? I just I love that film for that reason. Yeah, yeah that's exactly, yeah. yeah I know, the Dennis Quaid character is just like, yeah. oh, <laughs> that's a jerk. For real. And you know, he treats his ex wife so badly. And yeah, because yes. he thinks he's the aggrieved one. Yes, he does. And so far from it. <laughs> particularly when you think about the Dennis Haysbert character and then the Viola Davis character, then you have the Patricia Clarkson character there too. All of that, I mean, he's putting all of that front and center. That's so true, it's such a good example of that for sure. The top of Todd Haynes, man, <laughs> so good one, for real. Uh, Todd Haynes, the director of Shereen, uh, Todd Haynes who directed uh, Velvet Goldmine, Carol, Safe with Julianne Moore, which is a allegory about AIDS. 
in the eighties or, or one of the poison. That. Yeah, po yeah, poison. And yeah, the Karen, Car the Karen Carpenter superstar. Karen Carpenter story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Barbie doll movie, which is hard to see now because of copyright issues or whatever else. Yeah, because of the music. Yeah, you yeah. never got the music rights. No. Um. So Venus Extravaganza, uh, one of the women focused in the film, young woman, uh, speaks to wanting to have a traditional marriage in the church. Uh, what does it mean that she still longs for some of the more patriarchal trappings of society? Yeah, I mean, Venus is such a, it's such a tragic character, oh. um, you know, and it's just so, I mean, I think it just goes back to our conversations about beauty and femininity and, um, but I, you know, this equation of, I don't know, I think it, to me, it seems like, you know, by saying, you know, like what she's basically saying is, this is how I interpret it. Uh, you know, I want to be normal, mm. you know, I, I want a normal, I want a wedding, right? And I want a wedding in a church. Like I want it to be as normal, normal, normal as it could possibly be, right? And, you know, I, it seems like there's a struggle of, you know, like that there's a kind of rejection of uh, her life, mm -hmm. right, in this world as, you know, something where she could ever be fully happy and feel accepted and normal. Mm -hmm. And that's a really sad moment. Yeah, it was to hear her. And then, and so we know uh, that, you know, her murder is tragically detailed in the film. Uh, I mean, from my understanding. Well, Oh. I would say it's tragically not detailed, uh -huh. you know? Um, it happens off screen. Yeah. And we're just kind of told, you know, in a, in a title. And there's really no moment of reflection. Like, we don't grieve for her. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't mourn her. And she hasn't been re either represented as a fully rounded character. And, uh, you know, Bell Hooks goes to town on this. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just, you know, violence that's being committed on screen, I mean, she writes, uh, the audience does not see Venus after the murder. There are no scenes of grief. To put it crassly, her dying is upstaged by spectacle. Death wow. is not entertaining. Wow. Yeah. Um, and the fact and, that we don't, hear, we don't hear that she was found dead, four, she had been there four days or so before anybody even found her. Yeah, yeah. And then it's just like this little moment, right? And we're, we're also glossing over just how tragically common this is, right? Mm -hmm. for, for transgender people, particularly transgender women of color, right? Mm -hmm. And they're disproportionately attacked and murdered. Uh, 2021 was the highest number of murders, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the, since we've been keeping track of them, uh, which beat out the last highest year, which was 2020. Uh, and, you know, 2022 is sadly on track mm -hmm. to uh, have a larger number of murders of transgender women of color. And so, you know, I really think that's a very valid criticism of this film yeah. that, you know, that that is just glossed over as this little thing, you know, when it's it's so much, mm -hmm. unfortunately, apart. May maybe tragically described is better to say than detailed. <laughs> In that case, because it is true, I, I now that you know you mentioned it, I, 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 I think I had my own moment for Venus because the film, like you said, doesn't allow that. But you know, and, yeah. and I went and read up more actually after, and found out more details about her death and how it happened, how, and 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 knowing that it had been chronicled, a very popular character on Pose died the same way, uh, and not yeah. realizing, you know, I, I, you know, just till now, kind of making that connection to 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 Venus in that way. So, but. You know, what, what, what do you think it'll take, Michael, for those in political power to take the murders of, of transgender women seriously and to create legislation that will truly protect their existence? You know, I'm not going to pull any punches here. We are in very, very dangerous waters right now. Uh, I mean, when you hear some of those politicians, representatives uh, talk about queer people as pedophiles mm -hmm. and rumors and how uh, supporting your trans kid is child abuse. I mean, that's, they're, they're pulling tricks out of the Goebbels 
you know, map yeah. uh, plan. I mean, that is just like flat out dehumanization. And that dehumanization leads to violence, it emboldens people and it leads to violence and murder. Mm -hmm. And I am very concerned, I and mean, as many other people are, about you know, the future of our democracy and the safety of, of like massive amount of people who don't fit into this, you know, white patriarchal Christian vision of what the country should be. So unfortunately, I have to say, one thing that it's gonna take is to see trans people as fully human. I mean, you think in 2022, we weren't still, you know, we shouldn't still be having this conversation, but we are, right? Um, so uh, first, you know, we need for, and we need for, other folks to, you know, for the trans movement themselves, you know, trans community themselves, um, but, you know, other folks who are in power to, to really push back on what's happening. Like, I'm actually not seeing as much of a pushback as we really need to, you know, like calling them out, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Bobo. And I mean, what could, because what they're saying is life threat. I mean, it's literally life threatening. Right. Um, it literally leads to, leads to people losing their lives. Mm -hmm. And so, First, we need to basically get people to stop calling for the murder of trans people. Good question. I mean, because it, it is, I, I, you know, I was looking on, sad to say, I was looking at Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has it outlined uh, by decade uh, transgender, you know, the number of transgender murders, and they detailed them uh, best they can. But then I was looking at that, and it starts at a certain point. Uh, very recently, as a matter of fact, a recent point. And then when you're reading it, and, and I was looking at them, I said, I know there are more than this. Yeah, right. That's just what we know of. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's so many more. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the first thing that came to mind. I was reading, I said, this is not nearly, it's not nearly, a, this is not nearly, this is scratching the surface. It's what I really kind of felt like looking at, you know. Yeah, I mean, because many of them are homeless. And yeah. so, you know, they're not, you know, fully counted, or mm -hmm. they're they're not, you know, their families don't want to acknowledge that they were trans, I, or, you know, yeah. So much happened. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of Dorian Corey, uh, Dorian says at the end of the film, she makes this comment. That really, I actually ran it back a few times and listened to her say it. Uh, that I always had hopes of being a big star, but as you get older, you aim a little lower. Everybody wants to make an impression, some mark upon the world. You think you made a mark on the world. If you just get through it and a few people remember your name, then you've left a mark and you don't have to bend the whole world. And I think it's better to just enjoy it. Pay your dues and just enjoy it. If you shoot an arrow and it goes real high, hooray for you, right? And there was something so sobering about that comment, but there's this deflation of grandeur, like dreams had been dashed. And I was thinking about that with the older drag queens versus the younger ones and this notion of this focus of this emphasis, right, about the vibrancy, the, or the importance of youth to the vibrancy of drag culture and this kind of, the film kind of indirectly placing emphasis on this and how disillusioning it can be the older you become. Uh, what does Corey's observation mean to you that when given the film's narrative, how do you read her observation? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about this representation and, and one of the things that, you know, I love about fall culture, um, as I know it, is how intergenerational it is, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I really don't see a lot of, especially queer cultures, where there's, uh, you know, a reverence and respect that's given to elders, right? Mm -hmm. And I really do think we see this, you know, and they're, they're very wise and they're, um, you know, they have, they have empathy, they have compassion um, for the younger people. Mm -hmm. And so I really like that part of the representation. And I mean, I think I love those, those moments when she's talking about that. And I don't see it as sad. I mean, I think she's making a distinction between, you know, she's like no longer thinking of fantasy as an escape, but maybe fantasy as a way of, you know, under, some like better understanding what your reality actually is. And how I think she comes to this understanding that, uh, you know, actually it's all about being present 
and in the moment and enjoying life for what it is. And that these, you know, these are fantasies and they're fun. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's about what you're doing right now. And, uh, and it's one of the few times in the film also, uh, well, it's not one of the few times, but it's an important time in the film when, you know, part one, in one of those scenes, she's, she's actually talking about, how, you know, like she makes it universal, right? She says, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to be something else, you know, wanting to, to have a fantasy, wanting to, you know, chasing fame, et cetera. And I actually think it's a really beautiful moment, right? Where the audience, because, you know, one of the criticisms of the film and of you know, ethnography in general is the way that it, you know, it positions the audience as being separate from the subjects, mm -hmm. you know, right. and the subjects are there to be spectacle, to entertain and, you know, the direct, you know, it's like they're being, you know, works the, the natives are being explained to you, right? Mm -hmm. But here we have, you know, the well, native, you know, the subject reaching out and saying, you know, you, me, we are the same. You know, like this is um, the there's that that insider outsider distinction uh, is actually no, and I, and I think what that does is it you know it fully humanizes uh, Thorian, mm -hmm. and it also forces the audience to you know get out of this like armchair conquistador you know position <laughs> and like actually consider their own positionality and their own relationship with who they're seeing on screen. So I think it's really powerful. Yeah, it is. I mean, age in age is such a, I mean, I've, I've heard people say about, you know, when you're young and you're gay and you get to, you know, life is so much better. I said, but that's the same thing we say about youth culture period, right? I mean, that when you're young, that's when you travel, that's when you don't, you go and you find out who you are and you do all these wonderful things. And then, you know, then there is this feeling like, there's some of us, right, who have gotten older and we're kind of lamenting the fact that we didn't do certain things. And that's kind of what I heard from mm -hmm. Dorian in some ways, right, that she got, she's at this point where she's gotten older and there are things that probably didn't happen for her the way, uh, maybe I'm reading it more modeling than it was, but that's kind of like what I got from it, right, from her mm -hmm. statement that, you know, if it happens, it happens you know, this kind of whole notion of hooray for you, you know, but I, but age is really, really interesting to me in drag culture, because some of the people who take on the, the matriarchal and patriarchal roles within the houses aren't much older than the, than the other, than the members of the house that they're calling their sons and their daughters. And I always find that, that relationship to age, and like you said, that reverence for that experience to be uh, really, really interesting and in how that comes about. Uh, and the fact that we even see that some of the people who end up being, you know, going to these houses are as young as, you know, 12 and 13, 14 years old have been turned out by their parents because of not this lack of unacceptable, lack of acceptance, I should say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really beautiful representation of chosen family and how, you know, what what mother means in different yeah. cultures, you know, how it doesn't necessarily mean what it means in, you know, let's say, you know, white suburban culture, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, that it, it transcends age, you know, or it's, you know, age is just a different part of the calculus, right? In mm -hmm. this particular community. Um, one thing I was thinking about though, is that, you know, you're, that this question got me thinking about what would it have been like if this film had been made now or, mm -hmm. or if back then we had, you know, in this age of social media, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with influencers and Instagram stars and YouTubers and all of that, like, wow, like I, what would the, you know the folks in the film, um, you know, and some of them did have, you know, careers, mm -hmm. and in in some ways the film helped them, but they were already kind of on their way. But you know, for, like Lily Ninja was a choreographer, and mm -hmm. a couple of them were dancers for Madonna. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I wonder, like, wow, they would have taken on, like, they would have taken on a whole you know, had a whole brand, a whole um, different life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, would they have become even, you know, would they have become famous and would that theme have been sustainable? Uh, I mean, not that, you know, right. YouTuber influencers, like the end all be all, I mean, it's, you know, there's problems with that, mm -hmm. but it definitely has opened up income streams for people mm -hmm. that, you know, it wouldn't have been there otherwise. It's opened up career paths for people who, you know, might not have found that so 
really interesting, you know, it's really interesting to think what, what a difference 30 years makes. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, and it's the, it seems that seemingly right, YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and all these things, right, like the perfect venues, right, to kind of uh, explore those parts of themselves or to not only that, like you say, to just, you know, be as, to perform, actually, right? It's the perfect space for them to, perf to perform in that way. And, yeah. and, and, you know, create, create a brand, you know, yeah. for themselves, which, you know, would have been probably something that Dorian Carey would have been reflected on, you know, <laughs> the soullessness of that, but, um, yeah. but I, yeah, I just think that, I, I wonder if, if folks like Dorian Carey and Pepper LeBate, like, if it would have deprived them of having an understanding, you know, of like that very um, kind of reflective understanding of fame and happiness, you know, rethinking fame and happiness and all that, would that have been stunted in the age of social right. media? I wonder. Right. Like Carol says, it would be a, a good place for them to have found community, which I absolutely agree with. I think it would have really, uh, they could have really, that, that, I mean, an entire network where it could have been created in that way. Uh, yeah. Shireen, says, Shireen says, do you think that do you think they would be together? Is it in real life? Is that what, is that what you're saying? Uh, in real life, if they could use social media to explore and perform? Um, what do you mean together? Like, I wonder if if they had social media as an outlet and as the kind of community that Carol is talking about, they would expend the energy and the effort to actually be together in person. Oh, and, but because this kind, I, I agree with Carol that this kind of being together provides them with a very different kind of community with different benefits that being together virtually would not. And I wonder if you know people are kind of retreating to their corners of TikTok and whatever instead of you know yeah. making that huge effort. Yeah. Yeah, and so you know, Sarah and, and Layla both point out that the ball, ball culture is still happening, um, yeah. and it's global now. Um, uh, I've seen interesting documentaries from you know Islanders taking up uh, Pacific Islanders doing ball culture and, and learning boat, you know, and so it's still uh, a vibrant part of certain cultures, and it's you know semi underground. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I wonder. Like, it makes me think that you know. The, the specialness, the, what we could call it even, you know, mystical, spiritual, religious element of, you know, what, what was happening when this was the only way to come together and be in this celebratory performative space and be with others who were like you and doing something that was you know, frowned upon by popular culture, um, that this Base, then maybe we could speculate that it had kind of more of a uh, a mystical element to it than it would have today. But you know, we would have to ask people who are involved today, you know, if that holds up. Well, speaking of it, it, kind of making these spaces, I think more mainstream. Uh, let's you mentioned her already. Let's talk a little bit about Madonna. Uh, Madonna, you know, very famously. Uh, with the song Vogue, culturally appropriated voguing from ball culture. That's where she got it from. Uh, and, and, and this happened soon after the debut of this film. Uh, Vogue comes out in 1990, uh, 89, 1990, around that time. Uh, many within drag culture thought that Madonna doing this would change the game, right? And give them the recognition they, you know, have des you know, deserved for so long uh, that she would somehow give them credit. Unfortunately, she did not do that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and in fact, when the song faded and she went on to the next thing, that was the end of it, right? Outside of her performing it live or whatever. And we all know, right, that Madonna is a well-known ally of the LGBTQIA plus community, you know, in terms of her dances. She's always been outspoken about uh, LGBTQ rights and such. But what could she have done better here? You know, what would true allyship have looked like in this case? in terms of her in the song Vogue? Yeah, you know, it's multifaceted. You know, one, I think it is fully acknowledging 
that you are able to benefit from this because of your white privilege in ways that the actual, you know, practitioners and creators of this culture um, have not been able to, and to recognize the history of white people benefiting from black culture, you know, whether it's Elvis or the Backstreet Boys. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an interesting parallel, actually, of thinking about Debbie Harry's rap song, you know, Rapture, that okay. came out in 1981, mm -hmm. right? That was like the first, you know, yeah. that's how most people came to know about rap, right? So, you know, recognizing your role in it, and then, you know, can't have, creating models in which you're not just acknowledging or, you know, like throwing crumbs to, but, you know, can you fully collaborate? Can you fully bring people in um, to the process? And so I think, you know, with, I think Pose, you know, what is it like the two white guys that are behind it, but they brought in, mm -hmm. uh, they brought in actual, you know, trans, uh, trans people of color mm -hmm. to into the writing room, right? To work mm -hmm. on this and to actually be a part of the show's creation and, and take the lead in that way. Um, I think something like, you know, I was thinking about Orange is the New Black, right? Mm -hmm. How that's a good example of allyship, how, you know, Genji Cohen, uh, in, at least in interviews, right, talks about how uh, the, the white Piper character at the center of the, of the story, at least in, in season one, was the Trojan horse, you know, like that's what got mm -hmm. what was it, HBO to sign up. You know, she's like, I couldn't like start, uh, I, I couldn't pitch it as, well, this is about women in prison and, you know, it's a bit about, you know, uh, two black women and a Puerto Rican and, you know, like, like you know, most of the cast mm -hmm. is going to be people of color. It, no, she presented it as, well, you know, it's, it's the story of this beautiful white girl who graduated from Smith and, you know, nine years later, right, gets arrested. Okay, you know, it's, okay. And so it's like a fish out of water story, right? And then, but then I think she really does it to mostly a great job then of bringing the rest of the characters in mm. and they're they're not just subplots and they're not you know they are actually our main characters in their own right and they get a backstory and they get a story arc you know all of that mm. i think uh is a good example of allyship good point yeah and you wouldn't be a conversation with me without mentioning taylor swift so we're going to bring up taylor swift yeah um i think that she did, I, you know, I, she's come under criticism for it, but I think she did a great job with You Need to Calm Down, um, being an ally. You know, she, she made the video with Todrick Hall. Yeah. Um, right, you know, black gay dancer, who's, mm -hmm. you know, her best friend. Um, and he was the co-producer and he brought in a lot of great people who, you know, was like full of queer stars. And, you know, the lyrics, you know, don't be, why be sad when you can be glad, you know, mm -hmm. G-L-A-A-D, right? She supports that. Um, and I do think she has an authentic affinity um, mm -hmm. with the LGBTQ community. For all we know, she may be part of the LGBTQ community, but that's for another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and so I actually, you know, I think, you know, I do admire actually when celebrities take certain risks. I mean, you know, with Madonna, you know, we can definitely criticize her, but you know, then she comes out with justify my love. Yeah. And it was the first, like, it was the first mainstream representation of uh, gay se sexuality yeah. that I saw when it premiered on MTV. And, you know, she got a lot of blowback for that. Um, I, 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 I do think that was, you know, a good move and something that, that I admire. Or like Olivia Newton-John doing it in the physical video back in the eighties, and she got a lot of backlash. Oh, because I didn't know that. The, is there a gay representation? So at, so at the yeah, it is. At the or is end it just of, super camp? Well, at the end of the video, you know, it's all of the muscle men, and she's looking at, and then all of the men walk out together, hugged up. Oh, but you know, like that's a play on um on a uh, what's that movie with um? It's not some like it hot, but it's um Marilyn Monroe and what's that like blah 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 where they're on the boat and like, she's talking about how there's a song and she can't, she can't find someone who's interested in her because you know, all the men are like, they'll play tennis together and it's like super campy. Oh and, like, yeah, well her and Jane Russell. I know, uh, yeah. Gentlemen from her blondes. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So yeah. it's like super camp, you know, like definitely mm -hmm. referencing that, but not, but, but they, you know, to that certain extent, but, but 
you know, the justify my love, it's like it's yeah. bodies together, you know, it is it is gay sexuality <laughs> that definitely pushes the envelope. Yeah. Yeah, she does. I mean, I, I think some of the also the way that in that Madonna really hasn't discussed it either or kind of talked about it as cultural appropriation. She's kind of glossed yeah. over it, I think, over the years, really, and she's never really talked about it. I think so she has to be aware of that criticism. I mean, and, you know, because she's clearly adopted. I mean, and she even in the video uses, you know, I'm assuming, you know, just from what I know of her dancers, you know, her, you know, gay male dancers in the background, whatever else who are, do, you know, who are doing this, whatever else, but the way that she, I don't know, it's almost as if she created it. She, yeah, she, I mean, for sure, you know, when she benefits, she gets to be edgy, you know, but still yeah. white and straight. You know, so definitely, you know, it's a mixed bag with these representations. And I, you know, I did think it was interesting in in Pose how <laughs> when the when the Vogue episode happens, yeah, they make a point of being like, oh, you know, Madonna's like she's uplifting us, you know, she's giving us all this great opportunity. I mean, they do get a little bit into how you know then it goes away, mm -hmm. but they, they there's like no, you know, no one's mad at her for appropriating right. their culture. And I, I, you have to think. I mean, they actually used the, the Madonna song Vogue in yeah. the series. So, and, you know, I bet there were some contractual obligations yeah. there about yeah. how to represent yeah. that moment in history. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, really it was shined up, it was real pretty. Yeah. I think it's really interesting you're saying like, like nobody was mad, at, you know, like I said, the, nobody in the community was like upset with her. But then, you know, I think about the ways in which the Bell Hookses of the world or whatever have really taken her to task. <laughs> of like cultural critics, be Ruby Rich. People like that were taking her to task, right? Uh, you know, for having, you know, done this, right? And yeah, and like I say again, her not really speaking to it very much. Whatever. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. But you know, you look at, I mean, another good out, you know, Elizabeth Taylor um, yeah. was a great ally, you know, because she, I mean, she was one of the early, you know, advocates for AIDS awareness and helping folks with HIV. And she, you know, she didn't just wear a red ribbon. I mean, right. she, she create, you know, she raised funds, she gave money, she was like really involved. And mm. Madonna, from what I've read too, was, you yeah. know, not, not exactly Liz Taylor, but, you know, was an early AIDS activist, right? Yeah. You know, when it wasn't, you know, popular to be an AIDS activist. When Reagan um, was killing the, killing the whole community, as I told my students today. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, more people died of AIDS than um, died in Vietnam, uh, yeah. Americans, before Reagan ever uttered the word AIDS. Yep. It's so true. It's a yeah. different time. Yeah, it, it, it is with Madonna. It is in the I mean, it is with Madonna, it is, it's very, I don't know, it's, it, 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 you find this way when you don't want to take her to task for because she's done these other things, right? But, but then there is this way that she does need to be held accountable for this because this is a creative expression right that she you know adopted as seemingly her own uh mm -hmm. seemingly as her own i think she knows that it was you know but but i think that the way it was presented to the public is yeah i think people in general are very resistant to acknowledging the fact that uh a certain kind of privilege fortune uh luck Put them in the place that they're in you know like the famous um and richards telling you know george bush that you know he's he's someone who was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple yeah. right <laughs> you know yeah madonna like you're you are a talented musician mm -hmm. and your whiteness had just as much uh has just as much to do with getting you where you where you were you know behind your success as your talent yeah. Right. It doesn't mean you don't have talent. It just means, you know, to acknowledge your privilege. It just but, you know, people tend to be, you know, quite reluctant. Uh, yeah. That's up, you know, to really see that. Yeah. I always think about in Vogue, too, when she does the stretch where she names all of the movie stars. And they're all yeah, they're all white. Yeah. Lana Turner. Just, Turner. No, yeah. no Lena Horne, no Sidney Poitier. Doesn't I surely you could have rhymed that, Madonna. You could. Have, but they're all white movie stars. Yeah, I know. It's so explicit. Yeah. And right, I like, love yeah, you know, you're singing this song that's like from Black ball, ball culture. Yeah. And 
all over. Although I guess you could argue that, you know, well, black gay ball culture, this is who they see as glamour. So I'm accurately representing the culture, but but then I think you're just playing mental Olympics. And I would not, I would not subscribe. Because if we really want to be specific, I mean Rita Hayworth actually is a Latina. So yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. I'm sure a bunch of them are Jewish. Yeah. There we go. Oh. Um, to go back to what you were talking about earlier, this will be my last question, and I'll open the floor up to those of you in our audience who would like to ask the question. But I want to go back to talking about Jenny Livingston uh, and the controversy surrounding her in the film. Of course, as you mentioned already, Bell Hooks, I mentioned B. Ruby Rich already, people who were kind of critical of uh, Livingston's, the way, uh, this, you know, her approach to the film. Certainly, right, one of the things that she was criticized, uh, one of the controversies uh, was about the participants being paid for their appearance in the film, uh, which is usually not the practice for documentary film. Certainly off the record, I think she wanted to do that and certain people, they were going to sue. And then they found out they had already kind of signed agreements, which would have rendered them unable to sue. One participant was going to thinking of suing it for about $40 million. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of went away from there because they realized they didn't kind of have a leg to stand on, so to speak, contractually uh legally but livingston herself right when we speak about her privilege as a white woman but she is jewish she's you know a queer woman uh you know and and we talk about that and then bell hooks of course pointing out about her allowing white audiences to kind of peer into these spaces that are largely populated by uh queer black and latino bodies or like you said like conquistadors like you said Jean, kind of sitting there armchair watching uh, but still, the fact this movie, as we talked about at the top of the discussion, remains influential, uh, remains very popular. Is do you think Livingston may have bet quote unquote betrayed the subjects of her, of her film in any kind of way by doing this, by approaching it the way she did? Yeah, you know, my reading on it is that it was more, I, I more exploitive than betrayal. Mm -hmm. You know. I don't think she was presenting herself as anything like, I don't think she wasn't denying that she's, you know, a Yale student who was taking a summer class at NYU and was hiring a professional cinematographer and a professional editor um, to make the film. Um, you know, uh, Pepper LaBeja says, uh, it's a great quote in that article. I, I love, I think this is in a Vanity Fair article. I love the movie. I watch it more than often. And I don't agree that it exploits us, but I feel betrayed. So Pepper does. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was the reverse. Okay. Uh, when Jenny first came, we were at a ball in our fantasy and she threw papers at us. We didn't read them because we wanted the attention. We loved being filmed. Later when she did the interview, she gave us a couple hundred dollars. And she told us when the film came out, we'd be all right. You know, there'd be more coming. And uh, I guess what ended up happening is uh, 13 people in the film ended up splitting $55,000, you know, so not a lot. Um, I think I think that is a valid point that, you know, as a privileged filmmaker, when you're going into an underprivileged community and you're throwing contractual papers at them, um, that there's definitely a power imbalance there um, for the most part, you know, to make a generalization. I mean, she also talks about how, you know, some of the people in the book, they're like college educated. I mean, it's not, you know, a completely disenfranchised um, uneducated community. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, it is a community that's not, for the most part, familiar with, you know, how these things work, right? Right. Um, and so kind of, you know, that paper privilege that happens. So, you know, yeah, I think there was an issue there. Um, and, you know, counterpoint, I mean, the film costs $500,000. So that alone right there is like, <laughs> it's a lot of privilege that went into uh, making that film, right? And it was, it made three million, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a lot for a documentary, but right. you know, nothing for Hollywood. Uh, I know that when Super Size Me was bought at Sundance for a million dollars in like 2002, I think that was the most ever paid for a documentary. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm guessing that I would speculate that Livingston, you know, either just made back what she spent or, you know, didn't make, I don't think the profit market, you know, was that high. However, she certainly benefited in non-financial ways. I mean, you know, it gave her cloud, it gave her uh, a name. Yeah. It, uh, she, 
you know, has been the recipient of like Guggenheim fellowships and, you know, very prestigious awards and stuff. And that, but that said, uh, that's, she hasn't made another feature film. Um, right. She's been working on one for 10 years. She's made short films, but, you know, she certainly has been, you know, living a well actualized life and I'm sure a privileged life, you know, doing the teaching and the artist stuff that she does. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, I, I think it's a really complicated issue around that. You know, are we talking about exploitation in money? Are we talking about exploitation, you know, in um, image, et cetera? Um, I do think that the performers do have a leg to stand on, right? Mm -hmm. To talk about, uh, I mean, I think that's valid, you know? Uh, and I think that is, I, I, it's, not, it's not legally, uh, necessary for a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, to do things differently, but I do think they're ethically bound, um, especially when you're the white person going into a POC community. You know, uh, uh, yeah, you actually have to go the extra mile and really make sure uh, that people are on board with what you're doing. And you know, there's so many things that she needed to do. I mean, she needed to spend more time in the community. She needed to have someone, you know tell their own stories in ways that wasn't just, you know, white girl explaining it for us. I mean, a lot of things that she could have done differently. Um, and that said, I mean, you know, we're still watching the film today. I mean, it's, yeah. it is, it's, it, it's a really well-crafted film. Mm -hmm. um, great, great cinematography, great editing, great pacing, great characters, you know, it's entertaining. Yeah. Man. And I, I do think about too, sometimes the ways that, that people probably because of the film know more about these cultures than they would have without it. You know, it's such a dilemma, like, you know, they're kind of be in this situation. Yeah. Like, you've done all of this stuff wrong, but then there is this, right? That, you know, the exposure of it, the education of it, right? That ends up happening as well too, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Livingston says, you know, well, uh, she says different things, but it won't, she's like, well, you know, they could make their own representation if they wanted to, which is, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's like very ah. problematic. <laughs> but but then she also says at another point, oh, well, I mean, I had the resources to be able to uh, give them visibility. And I use, you know, I do think that it's like it's a double-edged sword, you know, you're like uh, a white filmmaker and you're making, you know, you're only using your privilege to tell white stories. It's like, okay, like, well, didn't you want to like focus on like other things going on? you know right so oh, okay you know it's it is a little precarious um but i think I, you know i think that hooks actually really nails it when she says the problem really is that livingston just doesn't acknowledge uh her voyeurism her privilege her access mm. um she never has to answer as to why she was focused on this community and Hooks gives this great example of like, you know, what if like a black female queer filmmaker, you know, made a documentary about white gay men? People would be like, well, why are you doing that? What's your connection to this community? That's really strange. Um, and no one does that with Livingston. They just, it, it, it just, it's totally normal for, you know, white person to go in and explain black culture. Right. Wow. Good point. So do we have anybody, anybody have any questions for Dr. Harrop or myself <laughs> about uh, the film? Any comments about what you saw in the film? Oh yeah, Layla, yeah, it's Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. That's right, Layla. That is, that, yeah. that's just like such an amazing, uh, Amazing. I actually um, started a drag king troupe in Austin called Kings and Things, and we did we did a great number of diamonds or a girl. <laughs> I was one of the people holding the in person. Nice. Diamonds. Nobody have any no, no comments about the film? Yes. Yes. Um, I just found it really interesting. Like when y'all were talking about uh, the parts where yeah. Venus, for example, had said. Uh, she wants to have a normal life. Mm -hmm. She wants to just be seen as a human being and not that it's not weird that 
she's trans. I guess I, I'm putting it very plainly, but mm -hmm. um, I just, I, it, it's really disheartening to, to see that point of view as a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a non-binary person, but I'm not trans. So it's like, I'll never understand that experience. Um, just to, to hear how she feels dehumanized. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just very disheartening. I was just, I felt, and it, like y'all said, of course, her, her ending was very tragic. It, it was kind of shocking to me when I heard that part and it, it hit me like a brick. Um, and it was heartbreaking to hear that uh, she met such a terrible fate. Mm -hmm. And so young for that, you know, all of those things that she says she wanted, right? And unfortunately for her not to be able to realize them in any kind of way, because, you know, she was murdered because somebody else has problems with their identity and who they are, you know, absolutely. Very good point. Holden, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, this is definitely one of my top five favorite movies um, because of the, the importance of the representation. Um, all of the, I guess, everything that we've been discussing aside, you know, I think that it, as, as a person of trans experience um, and, and not seeing that representation anywhere, and especially like in a, in a very human, um, hu human environment, I think that it, it, was, it was really crucial for my learning of my community, just the community at large, of what, what it can look like to be trans, like the good, the celebratory, the, the joy within that. And especially as, as a, uh, similar to uh, Dr. Harrop, you know, being a, a white person and as a passing, like the realness factor of my trans existence, it, you know, it, it definitely skews the, the lens of a lot of people looking, looking at me, seeing a person of trans experience and or maybe not even seeing a person of trans experience, just be just being assumed as potentially like cis het man, cis gay man, um, and and having having any amount of like connective tissue to to the to the elders of the trans community, um, I, you know, it, to me it is it is such a crucial film to to have in the repertoire of queer queer cinema. Um, and and to to speak to to the the question earlier of of Elliot Page and the, the patriarchy, you know, I, as a as a passing trans man, I I struggle with that every day. I struggle with with balancing my identity with the fantasy and the expectation of of my privilege, knowing that again from outsiders looking in, they they may only assume that the privilege that I have is of a cishet white man, which I, I, I take that, I, I take that very seriously. Like my privilege, whether it is assumed or otherwise, I take it very seriously. And, and I ensure that like, I take a seat when it's not my time, when it's not my turn, but to also propel those forward who, who, whose voices are predominantly forgotten or you know, muted. So I think that, you know, as, as far as the, the balance of the patriarchy and, and in the L word, Pam Greer was telling um, the character Max, I can't remember the actor or um, the actor who played Max, Max's character uh, about, you know, like, are, are you sure you want to transition? Like we need our strong butch lesbians. And uh, it's something that that I that I do actually battle often is is what what have I lost in in gaining what I've what I have. Oh. Um, so mm. it's it's nice to be to be able to view a film like this and and see the power and the joy and the despair and and know that we've come so far from having to hide away from the outside world just to celebrate our humanity and 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 create something together mm -hmm. um 
despite despite what what kind of exploitation has come from that i i do think that the the importance of the the um you know the the trans awareness and just like drag balls in general i think that that's that's something that i i wish more people sought out cool okay that's here you want to address yeah hold on i love everything that you said there's so many great things i really appreciate your you know your participation and putting yourself in here um and i think that of course it's absolutely valid and and uh lots of people have a great experience with this film you know just the visibility alone and and you know absolutely we're seeing people you know they're they're resilient they're celebratory they find joy through hardship uh, they're resourceful you know all of those things um, show up and you know we can't minimize the simple power of seeing yourself on screen right seeing a community and especially you know one that is thriving in some ways and make you what you say makes me think of uh, you know, the great interview with Harvey Fierstein in Celluloid Closet, where he talks about, mm -hmm. um, you know, any visibility for mm -hmm. him was what he wanted, even if it's, even if it's like the, you know, the worst of the gay villain trope. Uh, his, his thing was, you know, just seeing myself on screen, just seeing a gay person on screen is better than an absence. And mm -hmm. so with Paris is Burning, we don't just, you know, see queer people, queer people of color on screen. I mean, we see them as full human beings and, you know, by, you know all the vibrant stuff. And so, yeah, I think that definitely speaks to the strength of the film. Um, and I'm really glad that this film spoke to you this way and had a positive effect, you know, on you. And, and especially when you were younger, I really like what you said that you are a person of trans experience. And I really, I would just love if, if we would make that shift that, you know, what we're talking about, you know, it's the struggle need not be to affirm who is a real woman and who is a real man, right? The struggle is about being able to live as a woman and being able to live as a man, right? Being able to express the gender that you want to express. It doesn't matter, real, fake, whatever, you know? I mean, that's not the struggle. It's like, you know, with the gay movement, with the queer movement, it isn't like the end all be all isn't to affirm my right to be a gay man or to be a lesbian or to be queer or to be non bear No, the end all be all is to be able to love whoever you want to love, um, to be able to express whatever gender you want to express, right? And uh, I wish we could really get out of this entrenchment mm -hmm. in the, the identitarian, uh, because it, it forced like, you know, we're eating ourselves. I mean, we're attacking ourselves over mm -hmm. things that it, it's just, uh, it's, it's pointless, you know, and it's just, it's about the ego, uh, you know, realness of identity is about ego, in my opinion. Um, and I also, you said another thing that I, oh yeah, um, yes, you now having patriarchal power, etc. cetera, uh, you know, I speak to a lot of my trans male friends talk about how, you know, when they fully transitioned and were fully passing, how they were just like, can't believe the things that men actually say to each other and that what they do is they you know they stand up you know when someone is denigrating a woman and mm -hmm. you know and just assuming that because you're a guy you're going to just go along with it um they make a point of being like hey man that's not cool you know right. that's misogynist right you know that's you know and i think that definitely is uh incumbent on all trans people um, to do that, you know, if, when you find yourself in a situation where somebody is denigrating another and they feel free to, to denigrate another because of, you know, their perceived connection with you to stand up and say, hey, I mean, that's, I guess that's just like basic kindergarten, you know, stuff anyway, you know, someone's denigrating another person, you should say, hey, man, that's not right. right. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna have a proud professor moment. Holden is, is, is my kid, so. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I have a proud moment there. <laughs> exactly that. Uh, You're doing the Lord's work. You're doing the there Lord's you go. Work. <laughs> um, does anybody have any other comments before we wrap it up? This has been such a great discussion, uh, Dr. Harrop. Thanks so much. I mean, I've learned a lot from it also as well, too. It's been a long time since I've seen Paris is Burning. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm going to go read that Bill Hooks article again. It's been a long time since I've read that. So <laughs> I'm yeah. going to look that again. Uh, it's a good one. So, yeah, it's such, yeah, it's a great one. 
and and rest in peace to Bell Hooks for sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Shireen, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank right. you very much. I feel like, well, I know I learned a lot. Um, I was blown away by how self-aware everybody in the film was. And listening to this conversation, I had, you know, this may be a very obvious thing to everybody else, but I had this realization that as a heterosexual cisgender woman, I've never had to think about my gender expression and um, expression of my sexuality and all of that stuff. So of course I'm not very self-aware about that. And they are, but it's really, it's really cool to be thinking about those issues, particularly when so many people among us um, don't have that, that just automatic privilege that society gives them. Um, so I appreciate having this film and I'll, I'll watch it again. I'll watch it with my kids and um, uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mark. This was so fun to talk with you and yeah. to our audience as well. You know, y'all were great. We were a small group, but you were engaged and had some great comments. And um, I just really, really enjoyed this conversation. And I want to thank people for your participation. And um, and this opportunity has been great. I just this was a really great conversation to have, and I'm glad we could have it together. Yes. Thank you, Carol and Holden. Really appreciate your contributions. And Mocha, great to have you back. And Thank you. Have a great evening, back. everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Mocha Jane. See you. <laughs> <laughs>